Running out of money is one of the biggest fears of retirement. This fear can manifest itself if you don't prepare for a huge retirement risk. So in today's video, we'll walk through what that risk exactly is and a few solutions to make sure it doesn't impact you. So with that said, let's just jump right in. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Branson Financial Planning, where we're all about helping you achieve financial freedom. What is this big risk you speak of? The big risk I keep referring to is called sequence of return risk. Now, the term might sound like something out of a science fiction novel, but it's actually a critical element in retirement planning. To best illustrate what sequence of return risk is and what it means, let's look at a simple example. Person A and person B each have $100. Person A invests his money, and after one year, he experiences a 5% rate of return, giving him an ending balance of $105. After another year, he gets another 5% rate of return. A 5% gain on his $105 brings his total to $110.25. Now, let's say person B invests their money and gets 0% in year one, and then 10% in year two. If you do some quick math, you'll find that person B ends up with $110. Both person A and person B averaged the same annual rate of return over two years, 5%. But person A ended up with more money, 25 cents more. This exact scenario is sequence of return risk. The sequence of the returns or when the returns happened had an impact on the amount of money person A and person B ended up with. Person A had steady annual returns, 5% in year one and 5% in year two for a total of 10% and an average annual rate of return of 5%. Person B did not have steady annual returns. They had 0% in year one and 10% in year two. Person B's average annual return is the same as person A, 5%, but when they experienced their returns were very different. Person A only ended up with 25 cents more. That doesn't seem too bad. That's a very fair point. When dealing with small numbers like $100 in a short time frame, like two years, it doesn't appear that bad. But when you use more realistic numbers that reflect retirement, the numbers tend to look a little different. Let's look at an example with George and Martha Washington. George and Martha are retiring on the exact same day. They each have $1 million saved in their retirement accounts. They both need $40,000 per year, adjusted for inflation, from their portfolio to cover expenses. Let's fast forward 30 years later and we see that George achieved a 10% average annual rate of return on his investments, while Martha averaged an 8% average annual rate of return. Looking at just these numbers, you would assume that George would end up with more money since his average annual rate of return is higher. But that's not the case for George. He actually ended up with less money than Martha. George ended up with $2.7 million, about $800,000 less than Martha's ending balance of about $3.5 million. George's investment returns were higher. How is that possible? Well, let's take a closer look to see why. If we break apart George and Martha's returns, we see a story that explains exactly what happened. Our buddy George here fell victim to some poorly timed returns. Right when George retired, his investments performed negatively, averaging negative 3% per year for the first five years. He did great for the remaining 25 years, averaging 12.6% per year, which bumped his average annual return up to 10%. Martha, on the other hand, was the definition of consistent. She got exactly 8% per year every single year, and thus her average annual return was 8%. Our friend George here simply couldn't make up the loss of capital he suffered in the early years of his retirement from investment returns and the fact that George was drawing on his portfolio for income. George simply had poorly timed investment returns? Correct. The sequence or order of his returns put him in such a hole that he simply couldn't make up for the fact that he had negative returns his first five years, even with superior returns the final 25 years of his life. The sequence of his returns made a huge impact on his wealth. And it's very important to understand that this impact is felt when you are forced to take money out of your retirement accounts when your investments are performing poorly. Sequence of return risk is not a concern in your early years. When you're saving and accumulating money in your retirement accounts, it's really only felt when you're forced to sell your investments when they're down to maintain your lifestyle or standard of living. 
How long does it take George to get back his original $1 million he started with? Great question. Overall, George saw his portfolio begin at $1 million and drop down to $670,000 by the end of the fifth year. Beginning in year six, his investment returns were greater than the amount he was taking out of his account annually for retirement income, and he began to see his balance grow again. It took George an additional 12 years to get back to his original $1 million. 12 years. Meanwhile, Martha, on the other hand, she's having a great time. In fact, by the time George was closing in on his original $1 million in year 18, Martha's portfolio was growing to $2 million. Martha's investment returns were greater than the amount she was taking out of her portfolio for income, so her portfolio just continued to grow nice and slow. So you're telling me to avoid poorly performing investments during retirement? Got it. Okay, wise guy, it's a little more than that. The whole point of all this is to show that when you experience your returns is equally as important as the returns themselves, when in retirement. Remember, a 50% loss requires a 100% gain to get back to your starting point. George was a shining example of this fact. Even with superior returns in the 25 years following his slow start, he still couldn't catch up with Martha, simply because of the sequence or the order of his returns. Big losses at the beginning required even bigger gains to make up for the slow start. What happens if George didn't have a negative rate of return in his first year? This is a great question, and let's take a little look. Let's assume the exact same scenario we've been looking at with George and Martha. The only difference, George is going to achieve a positive 5% rate of return in year one. Then he'll still average negative 3% in the next four years, and then 12.6% the remaining 25 years. In our example, original example, George ended up with $2.7 million. How much do you think George ends up with now? Well, just by simply assuming a 5% rate of return instead of negative 3% in only the first year, George ends up with about $4 million. That's about $1.3 million more than our original example, simply by having a rate of return that's slightly better in year one. That is a huge difference in wealth and really shows the impact negative returns can have on a portfolio in the early years of retirement. How do I avoid becoming George? Well, I thought you'd never ask. Let's look at some examples of how we can mitigate sequence of return risk so you can sail into a secure retirement. First up, diversify your investments. By spreading your money across different investment types like stocks, bonds, insurance products, real estate, you can reduce the overall risk in your portfolio. And remember, just because two assets are different doesn't necessarily mean they bring diversification. Diversification is an important factor when you have uncorrelated or negatively correlated assets, meaning when one investment does well, another typically does poorly. This shields your portfolio from big losses that can really have a huge impact on your portfolio. Next up, be flexible with your withdrawals. So during periods of poor investment returns, consider withdrawing less from your retirement savings. Pretty straightforward. If you take less money out of your retirement accounts in retirement, your money will last longer especially in times of market downturns. For example, some people are okay with having variable portfolio withdrawals in retirement that are tied to investment performance. You basically draw more money on your investments when your investments perform well and less money when your investments perform poorly. Next up, you could also maintain a larger than normal cash reserve. So having a cash buffer can help you weather short-term market volatility without having to tap into your investments during a downturn. This has not been a very popular strategy the past 10 years due to the low interest rate environment we've been in. As of making this video though, interest rates are much higher and could make cash a much more viable option. Next up, rebalancing your portfolio. Always remember to rebalance your portfolio. Periodically review your investment mix and make adjustments to ensure it remains aligned with your goals and risk tolerance. The act of rebalancing your portfolio is selling winners and buying your losers. Or put another way, you're selling high and buying low. Next up, you can also delay retirement or work part-time. Staying in the workforce a bit longer or working part-time can reduce the amount you need to withdraw from your savings, giving your investments more time to recover. Simply put, the less you can draw on your investments when they're performing poorly, the better for your overall portfolio. Anything else I should know? 
Yes, plan ahead of time. This isn't something you should be thinking about the day before retirement. This is something that should be planned for three, four, five years or more before retirement. Your retirement could be severely impacted by not planning for this ahead of time. Thanks, Jeff. You're very welcome. If you want to chat more, go to my website, bransonfp.com and schedule in some time to chat. Thanks, and I'll see you out there.